Good morning. Well, this uh, this was um, uh, this is uh, Lorna's uh, first time in chairing the service. Uh, didn't she do well? Amen. Well, we're all family, you know. This is our performance. It's really a worship. <clears throat> it's an act uh, of worship to God in the different areas in which we serve in, whether in stewarding, chairing, praying. You know, we're all parts of the, the same body of Christ. We're all family. Turn to one another and say, we are family. And so now we're going to uh, turn to the Word of God. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to uh, bring the Father's heart. You know, what has God got to tell us, to speak to us today? So let's just pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come, Lord, into your very presence and as we read your word, we ask for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to bring that conviction. Lord, to give that revelation into our heart so that, Lord, we can understand the truth and your truth will set us free. Lord, we come against Lord, all sorts of wrong mindsets, even lies that we believe in our lives, Father. But this is not what uh, you want to hang on to. So, Lord, we ask for your word, Lord, and by the power of your Spirit to bring that liberation in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today is the second and the final part of a two-part sermon on the life of Saul and David. Uh, fear of man or fear of God. Last week, we looked at the life of Saul. He's not a man who fears God. He rather fears man more. And as a result, he seeks approval of man at the expense of the approval of God. We read of his life, that he started well. He came from a well-to-do family. He's ahead over the rest of the Israelite men of his time. And yet, sadly, as Proverbs 29 verse 25 says, the fear of man lays a snare. The fear of man lays a snare. It traps you, and you're not able to get out of it if you do not turn to the fear of God, which is what we're going to study today. And so Saul, the first king of Israel, entered into a sequence of self-destruction when he defied God's order and rather to please himself as well as to please his men. That even though he was anointed by the prophet Samuel, he had the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us he has a changed heart. He's a man that started well, but he ended badly. So we cannot presume that just because we have certain gifts, anointings, that we start, we, we start off well in our ministry, in our life as a, Christi as a Christian, that we will necessarily end well unless we continue to keep obeying God. Because the enemy will not stop firing at you, his fiery darts. The devil will not keep telling you lies until you, you may believe in him. So we need to constantly refresh ourselves in the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. You know, the trouble of Saul also started and surfaced when David killed Goliath. The Israelites were praising God, rejoicing that they managed to defeat this enemy who has been taunting them for so many days. And yet, even though the giant Goliath has indeed fallen, but out of his ashes, so to speak, rose a new giant, a more sinister giant, the giant of jealousy. And Saul resented David because of David's success and the people celebrating the victory of David. And there was a new top hit that Saul kills thousands, but David tens of thousands. That Saul wanted to kill David. And today we want to zoom into just one encounter between King Saul, the hunter, and David, the hunted. We're going to read today's passage from 1 Samuel chapter 24. Verses 1 to 18. So if you have your Bibles, do bring your Bibles with you. We're going to read together from verse 1 to verse 18. I'm going to read from the NIV. So if you have the NIV, let's read together. Let's read aloud together. I'll just read for you. 1 Samuel chapter 24, starting from verse 1. Okay, bring your Bible. It's the sword of the Spirit. Okay, verse 1. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, 
David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crates of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The man said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord, the king! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord gave you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize that I'm not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Verse 14, against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. And when David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I've treated you badly. You have now just told me of the good you did to me. The Lord gave me into your hands, but you did not kill me. And so on. And Saul actually later on asked David that when you, became, when you become king of Israel, please spare my descendants. You know, the Bible tells us that Saul has just finished chasing out the Philistines at the beginning of the chapter. But David was a wanted man. There was, and there must be a very high price tag over the head of David. And there were spies all over the land of Israel to spot this David wanted by the king. And one day, a spy reported to King Saul and said, We spotted David in the desert of En Gedi. So let's have a look. This is the present day En Gedi, very near the Dead Sea. You know, it's full of caves. Uh, next one. There's also a very beautiful waterfall there, spring, basically. And uh, the Bible tells us David was actually sort of hiding there. And so in this location, this is where this encounter happened. And so King Saul took with him, rallied with him 3,000 crack troops, the best among his troops, to set out on this manhunt for David and his 600 men. So a ratio of 5 to 1. I wonder, what would you be thinking as David? After all, you have risked your life to fight against Goliath. You are the national hero. You did the most distinguished and heroic act. You delivered the nation from the humiliation and taunt. And now you're hunted like a rabbit. And a scholar, or some scholars actually counted. How many years do you think that David was on the run from, from Saul? Anything from 4 to 12 years. That is a long time that, Saul, uh, that David was on the run. What is in the mind of a fugitive? If you have watched the series Prison Break, you have known that as somebody who's being hunted, you can trust no stranger. You do not know whether this stranger who, can, who may recognize your face may betray you to the authorities. 
You have to be always on the move. You have to make sure that you wear a hoodie all the time. David was literally exiled from his homeland. He was spending years in the wilderness. He was actually married to King Saul's daughter, Michal. And here Michal was left, his wife was left in the, in, in the palace, enjoying the king's wine and the cuisines. But he lived like a scavenger after the, you know, what you can get in the wilderness. And so you could imagine that it's not just David, but his, his band of men must be weary and restless of always, of being always on the run. So against this backdrop, Saul and his men arrived at this place in En Gedi. And all of a sudden, Saul has a nature's call. He has to find a place to relieve himself. So he went to the nearest cave, not knowing that in this very cave, in the deeper recesses of the cave, hit David and his cohort. Wow, here was a chance for David to kill King Saul. His bodyguards were not with him. And David's men saw and said, Oh, David, here must be God's providence to bring your enemy right here in front of us. Here is a chance to kill him. Here is an opportunity which is within your sword. And so as David crept up to a Saul, what would have crept on David's mind? This ungrateful, jealous old man that caused me so much misery. This is your last day. Can it be that thought that would run in David's mind? I could have been a father by now had it not because of you. After all, Samuel had anointed me to be the king. And since you are trying to kill me, why am I not allowed to kill you? Perhaps these thoughts might have run in David's mind. A stroke of the sword will end my years of wandering, and the throne is within my grasp. After all, Saul is nothing compared to Goliath. But so, with a stroke and a twist, David let go of his sword. But he did not cut off Saul's head, but instead he cut off a corner of his robe. And the Bible tells us, why did David not kill Saul? Why was his conscience stricken? And other Bible translate translations would say that his heart was struck. Why was he even showing regret that he has cut off part of the corner of Saul's robe? In verse 6, he told his man, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord or Yahweh's anointed. Whenever you see the capital L-O-R-D, in Hebrew, it's actually Yahweh, the name of God. I am who I am. David would not allow providential circumstances or his own suffering to overrule the sovereign work of God. This is a mark of a true leader, that the true man of God or woman of God always look to the sovereignty of God. Even though that you may suffer as a result, you still look to God as your final judge. But here is a man who fears God more than he fears man. Here is David who fears God more than he fears the sufferings that he's going through. He fears God more than the number of years that he may have to go on to be hunted by Saul, even though he, he let go of this opportunity. Here is a man who will not attempt to shorten God's timing, to use human reasoning and not trusting in the Lord's sovereignty. It is not up to David to take the place of God. Perhaps by cutting Saul's rope, he was showing disdain to Saul and someone appointed by God. Perhaps cutting uh, the corner of Saul's rope was the way that David may be trying to tell Saul to say, look, remember the last time you tore somebody's ham? That was the prophet Samuel. When Samuel said, you know, God is going to give your kingdom to another person. And remember in 1 Samuel 15, King Saul went to the prophet Samuel and said, please don't leave me, please don't leave me. As a result, he tore off from the hem of his garment. And Samuel turned around and said, this is what's going to happen to you, that your kingdom will be torn away from you. Perhaps David was using that to um, remind Saul he was rubbing salt into Saul's wound. He was fueling his jealousy, not helping Saul to turn around. Perhaps that was the reason why David was conscience-stricken, that perhaps he was thinking a bad thought against Saul. David 
is a man who fears God. What is the fear of God? Where is the fear of God? In today's society, God seems to be losing popularity. You know, as more people say, I don't believe in God, why should I fear Him? As mankind, humankind, makes his ascend, uh, ascendancy towards a greater control of his life, a greater expansion of scientific knowledge to, to know that, okay, I can treat this, this, uh, this particular disease. I can understand the physics and the laws of how the stars move in heaven and of how things work, that there is a reason behind floods and earthquakes and, and so on. Not being able to explain that where do these laws come from in the first place. So to fear God, even among Christians, is out of vogue. It's not a popular thing now to say, here's a man who fears God. Whereas the Bible say, you know, so and so is a God-fearer. And if you say that so and so is a God-fearer, it may even raise certain eyebrows in the church and say, oh, is it? But the Bible tells us that the fear of God is one of the greatest virtue. John Murray said, that the soul of godliness is the fear of God. This year's theme is to be trained in godliness. But do you know the very engine of godliness, the things that drive you to want to be, God, to, to be godly, is the fear of God. It is the fear of God, brothers and sisters. And so what is this fear of God? There are two types of fear. The first type of fear is that of dread and terror. This fear comes about because you know that you're going to be punished. The fear of God that brings dread is to really to people who persistently disobey God. And that can be Christian because you fear the punishment that even your father will discipline you because you continue to be disobedient to God. But more so that this fear of God is really to non-Christians who do not lift up to the standard that they know have been written into their hearts, that they know that if you ask them, have you really broken the moral laws that God have written in your hearts, they will probably would say yes, even though they do not believe in God. And so there is in every, I believe in every unbeliever, you know, that there is that fear to say, when I die, I do not know where I'm going. Will I be judged for the fact that I did not live up my life to the moral standards that is written in my heart? It is, a, it is a fear that a sinful man who has violated God's law will, will have inside him or her as he or she prepares to face judgment after death. But as Christians, we should not suffer from this fear. After all, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, the author says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So this is not the dread and the terror of Christians coming before God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because your sins have been forgiven. In Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 15, he said, you, Paul wrote, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons as we cry, Abba, Father. So as we become more and more like Christ, this fear of being punished, of being disciplined by the Father, should become less and less. But I believe that this fear is also good because not all, not all well, in fact, all of us are not perfect. And we need to be aware that God will discipline us. When we sin, God will hold us accountable. But what this fear of God that David has is a second type of fear. This is a fear that is caused by the reverence, the awe, the honor, the adoration, the worship, the fascination of who God is. Just now we, we sang, you know, a couple of songs that describe about, I fall down at your feet. When I think about who you are, the, you know, the, uh, who was and is and is to come, the God of the eternity. We are awed by God's worth, His dignity, His majesty, His power. We are bowled over by his knowledge, his intelligence, his beauty in his creation. And Calvin says, you know, the whole of creation is a theater of God's glory. We should be awed by what God, 
himself has designed. He is the bestest of the best of philosophers, scientists, artists, musicians, architects, lawmakers, builders, designers, all roll into one and infinitely more so is our Father God. And he surpassed the wisest of man, such that in the Bible, in the book of Romans, Paul says that even the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisest of man. Such glory of God should, should, should thrill us, should amaze us by his love that he's shown to us, by the grace that he gave to us through Jesus, by the sort of justice that God paid, you know, for our sins through what Jesus had done for us. We should prostrate before his transcendent power, his glory, his holiness. That should be that reverence and that fear of God that we Christians must have in our hearts. But first of all, you must realize that the fear of God is a gift from God. Do you know that? This fear of God is a gift from God. And therefore, it should be cherished. It should be sought after. It should be embraced. It should not be avoided. The fear is for our own good and for our generations forever. If you don't believe me, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah 32, verse 38 to 41. Can there be such a good thing about the fear of God? Isn't all types of fear bad? But I tell you that this fear of God is good. It is a fear that we should pursue. In Jeremiah 32, verse 38. This is what God says. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me into their hearts that they may not turn from me. I repeat, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. This is God's covenant of saying, I will do good to you. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. You see, the fear of God causes us not to turn away from Him. And verse 41, And I will rejoice, says God, in doing them good. Wow. How to make God happy? When God does good things for us, when we fear Him. Amazing. That God rejoices in doing good to us. And God says, I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. God delights in doing this. And he says, I will put the fear of me in their heart. So this fear of God, this reverence, uh, reverential fear of God is given to us by God so that we will not turn away from him. Maybe why we're so, you know, all the time struggling away with, with all the sort of temptation and sin and all the time to say, Lord, I, I always sin against you. Perhaps we have missed out of the fear of God. That's why we struggle so much as Christians with sin. But if we really embrace with this fear of God, the Bible tells us so that they will not turn away from me. So the fear of God is a grace gift. It comes with the covenant, this new covenant that we have with God. And as we fear God, God actually rejoices to do us good. And God wholeheartedly, diligently will plant us in our land. You will not be moved. You will not be shaken. That's what God is saying. And of course, that is a word to Israel. But we are, you know, connected to Israel, grafted. And, and our land is where God has placed us, in your home, your workplace, your life. And God says, I will plant you faithfully in this land. And I will rejoice in doing you good. Wow, such a promise to make God happy. It's not what you do for God. Hallelujah. But God is happy when he does good to you. Provided, you know, you have the fear of God in your heart. When you worship God, when you adore God, when you really come to know God the Father, who he really is, not as a celestial policeman waiting to smash your head and so on, but someone who loves you, somebody who wants to show you that he can do far more that you can ever ask or imagine. And therefore, in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 6, it talks again about the fear of God. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 6, 
that the fear of God is the treasure of Zion. And here it says, and he will be the stability of your times, the abundance of salvation, wisdom and knowledge, and the fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. What is, a, what is treasure? What is a treasure? It's something that is precious, right? It's something that you need to uh, guard it. It's something that is worth your time to hang on to it, uh, to even focus on it and to delight in it. Is it not true? That's your treasure. A treasure is something that uh, occupies you, uh, something that you would value, something that you would not hide. Is that not true? Because it is precious. It is something that you constantly think about. The fear of the Lord. Not the sort of dread and terror. Oh, you know, God's going to punish me. No, but who God is. Think about His beauty. Think about His love towards you. Think about His knowledge of you. That He knows you even before you were created. Formed in your mother's womb. Think about His purpose for you. Think about His kindness towards you. Think about His justice. Think about His beauty. I know some of you went to see the meteor shower and so on, right? This is the time of the year. Think about the stars were created, even for man's enjoyment. Fear the Lord. The same fear makes Job to be one of the few righteous men that God talked about. In Job chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless, he's upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. When you fear God, you have that inclination to shun evil. But if you do not fear God, if you fear man, if you fear other things, evil becomes stronger and you may not find you have the strength to shun evil. That's why Oswald Chambers says that um, if a man has a fear of God, he will not fear anything. But if, if a man does not hear, have the fear of God, then he will fear everything. If a man of God has, uh, sorry, if a man has a fear of God, he will not fear anything. But if a man does not have the fear of God, he will fear everything. It's a treasure. It's something that God has given to us. It's something that is it's worth thinking about it. It's worth pursuing. It's worth reflecting. So you ask, oh, maybe this fear of God is just an Old Testament characteristic. But do you know in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 31, it, Luke writes this word, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit it multiplied. Walking in the fear of the Lord. And the Greek word for this walking is starting on the journey. Walking in the fear of the Lord. In other words, our life must be a journey of the fear of God. Again, this word, this English word fear, is not, you know, gives negative connotation. But actually, you know, in the, in the Hebrew, it's, it's actually positive as well as negative, right? So as children of God, we embrace the positive aspect of this fear of God. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, not fear like, oh, I can't do this. Oh, God's going to punish me. But the fear of the trust and confidence of the knowledge of who God is. And 1 Peter chapter 1, 17, he says, conduct, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Is what the apostle uh, tells the churches. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So the fear of the Lord is important. The fear of the Lord will bring great blessings. The church will multiply. You will be established. You will be, and God will be rejoicing over what the good He's doing for you. You know, in Isaiah chapter 11, it's a prophecy by Isaiah on Jesus, the coming Messiah. He says, that he has, uh, Jesus was prophesied as one who has the Spirit of God over him. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Listen to this. Verse 2. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. 
the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Jesus delights in the fear of the Lord. As a son of man, he fears a father, not in a negative sense of dread, but a fear of, of admiration, of reverence and awe of who God the Father is. Because the fear of the Lord is the foundation of all wisdom. In fact, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs 1 verse 7. And so, when you have the fear of the Lord, you have wisdom. You'll be able to deal with situations in your life. That's what we need, wisdom. When you have the fear of the Lord, you have understanding. You have the clarity of heart to know how to deal a problem with problems and how do you conduct yourself in life. When you have the fear of the Lord, you have counsel, which is a revelation to understand the Word of God, what is right, what is wrong. When you have the fear of God, you have a power. Not necessarily power to, not physical power only, because the power represents, you know, the endorsement of the purpose of God. It can be the power for you to be emotionally strong. You know that you need a lot of power to be emotionally strong. To deal with the challenges of life, you need the fear of the Lord. When you have the fear of the Lord, you have knowledge. This knowledge is not about human knowledge, it's about the knowledge as you fellowship with the Father, you know more of God. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I am struck by the fact that I need to have the fear of the Lord. I need to have the fear of the Lord. So often when we come to, you know, we come to God only when we have problems, all right? Or we just say, well, God is so holy. And let me not just approach Him. I wonder if you are in that category as Christians. Maybe the second type of fear of God is something you need to develop. You need to work on because it is the treasure of Zion. It's very easy to have your treasure stolen. It's very easy to have your treasure hidden. So how do you bring out this treasure of the fear of God? You know, David wrote about this fear of God. He is a man who fears God. He's a man that God says is after my own heart. So in Psalm 34, in verse at, at 11, he says, he wrote, he, uh, he wrote these words. He said, come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. First one, your speech. Secondly, turn away from evil and do good. Your conduct. Turn away from evil and do good. Thirdly, seek peace and pursue it. This is your predisposition. I'm not one who's there always against people. I'm there to pursue peace. I'm a peacemaker. Pursue peace. So, first, let's look at speech. Do you know that David, even though he complained to God about Saul, he never bad-mouthed Saul. David never bad-mouthed Saul. He never told his man, Saul is a wicked person, you know, curse him and so on. Never. He never showed disrespect to Saul in his speech, I believe. Do you know that if you have the fear of God, then your tongue must be a controlled member of your body. We have to realize that we live as Christians, not just naturally, physically here, but in the spiritual realm. Right? That's why you can't see the devil, you can't see demons, but they are real. And our speech, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18 verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life lies in the power of the tongue. That's why Jesus says, every careless word you say, you, God will bring you to account one day. So be careful of our tongue. Keep your tongue from evil. Do you know that in the spiritual realm, in Ephesians 4, you know when we sin, we give the devil a foothold in our lives. And one of the, the sins is to have unwholesome talk coming out of our mouth. Because instead of speaking and, and blessing peace into a situation, if we join in, in our office gossip, in backstabbing, in criticizing our leaders, or speaking evil, 
of our leaders, whether it's Christian leaders or even, I would believe, even our, our government. You are actually abetting the work of darkness and evil. Now, it does not mean that we agree with everything that the government does, all right? But we speak no evil of them. We can confront them. We can lobby them. We can protest. But that's not speaking, that's not doing evil. Same thing with Christian leaders. You don't gossip, slander. If you, are, you need clarification, you want to confront your leaders, do that one-to-one. -one. Bring another person with you. That is the right way. But to speak evil, gossip, slander, you are stirring up the spirits in the spiritual realm. You know, the demons will run even, you know, in greater uh, effect in a situation. But we have, therefore, to be very mindful of our speech. Therefore, Paul says, pray for those in authorities. Pray for the kings, for all those who rule with supplications. Pray, pray on their behalf with thanksgiving for every good thing they do. Thank God for that. And Paul was referring to the Roman emperors at that time, not a friend to the church. So the same thing must apply in our office. We go into our office, we bless the people. Even though you have a, a bad boss, so to speak, you bless him and pray for him. Pray for all the decisions. Because if we start to join in uh, the office gossip, no wonder you know, your office is so in a mess and so on. There's a lot of politics, nothing is moving and so on. Same thing in your home. If between husband and wives and parents and children, you start to you know, criticize each other and, and, and talk things that are not true, not upbuilding. Uh, in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about do not let unwholesome speech come off your tongue. Anything that does not build up is not wholesome. No wonder your family is in a mess. No, no wonder families are falling apart. And so we are to keep our lips from deceit, but to speak the truth in love. All right? So in a church, none of us is perfect. Leaders are not perfect. That things are done wrongly, speak the truth in love. This is what it should be. And when you do that, in the spiritual realm, you are guarding, you are bringing in the presence of God. You are putting away, decreasing the power of the demonic, working in the spiritual realm in which you are placed. Because the Bible tells us that as Christians, we are seated in the heavenly places. Therefore, there is a spiritual realm in which you have to guard, in which you have to influence. And if your tongue is running wild and speaking out unwholesome words, evil, no wonder you're letting the enemy in. All right, so therefore, the fear of God teach you to have the fear of God. David say, mind your tongue, this first one. Secondly, is your manner of life. You know, David did good to Saul. He didn't kill him. In fact, he told his uh, band of men, to say, come on, I don't allow you to kill Saul. I'm sure some of them say, David, look, you're a good guy, all right? You don't want your, your hands to have blood. I'll kill Saul for you. He would say, no, you're not allowed to. Here in, the, in NIV, it says, Paul rebuked, uh, sorry, um, David rebuked his people. Okay, but in the Greek translation, as I gather, it said, he actually tore into the, among his men, he basically barged in and said, no, not allowed, not allowed to discredit Saul, not allowed even to think about killing Saul. That's basically his word. He has a good manner of life, of doing good. And so we must reject, shun evil, reject everything is, that is evil. Jealousy is just one of the works of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 19 gives us a whole list. The fear of God, you're going to shun evil. Shun sexual immorality. Shun impurity. Shun sens uh, sensuality. Shun all forms of idolatry. You, have the, you want to have the fear of God? Shun sorcery, enmity, shun strife, shun jealousy, shun fits, fits of anger, shun rivalries, shun dissensions, avoid divisions, avoid envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. That is to shun evil. And this is how you have the fear of God, is to shun this evil, because you say, Lord, I want you to be, I want you to, I want to glorify you, I want you to be, to be pleased with my conduct, so I will shun evil. And I'm so thankful that when I have the fear of God, that you delight in me, and you even delight in doing good to me. Hallelujah. You know? And that doesn't stop there. God does good to you. Why? So that you can do good to others. This is what the Bible tells us, is it not? Turn away from evil and do good. Not just shunning from evil, which is a, sort of a negative aspect, but the positive aspect is to do good. So God bless you with good so that you can do more good. 
or rather you can't do, do more good. You do the good that God has given you the good to do. Amen? So God may bless you in many ways. In your ability to connect with friends, in your finances, uh, in your gifts, spiritual gifts, in your natural gifting. Hey, there are plenty of opportunities. If you just look around, I tell you every day, there are opportunities to do good. No excuse for saying, I don't have the chance to do good. Okay? I was so glad that uh, I was talking to a brother just a few days ago and said, I was, uh, I think, washing his, uh, the part in the front of his house. And uh, a lady across the road said, oh, where do you get that uh, piece of equipment, you know, to clean? And this is an old lady. And this brother said, I'll come and clean for you. So he did power wash or power jet or whatever, uh, this, this neighbor. And as a result, this neighbor was then invited to say, how about coming to join us in our Christian monthly meeting? And she said, okay, for prayer. And she said, oh, yeah, I'll come along. You see, when you do good, when you do acts of kindness, Shock your friends, shock your neighbors, shock strangers to do good to them. And God will work. This is the spiritual realm, all right? Keep your tongue from evil. Shun evil. Speak the truth, sorry. Shun evil and do good. This is how you, how David said, I'll teach you to have the fear of the Lord. And thirdly, disposition of peace. You know, David pursued peace. He's a peacemaker. He even prostrate himself to Saul in order to say, Saul, please do not hold that anger in your heart. Who am I? I'm just a dead dog. I'm a flea before you. I have no intention to kill you. Look, I have an opportunity to, this is a, a proof that I cut off that piece from your rope. I could have killed you, but I didn't. I appeal to God as my judge. So this is the life of a peacemaker. Now, yes, there may be injustice. Yes, there may be wrongful things done to you, like what David had been through. But the mark of a leader is that of a predisposition to peace. And this is what God wants us to be. Blessed are the peacemakers, for you are the children of God. So we have to learn not to just say, okay, I'm not at war with you, but rather we try to build up one another. We must build up the peace in our families, in the, our workplace. And Paul says, where possible, live in peace. With one another. Of course, not everybody wants to live in peace with you, but your predisposition is a peacemaker. Pursue peace. This is what uh, David says. I teach you how to have the fear of God to so keep your tongue from evil, from deceit, shun evil, do good, and pursue peace. When you do that, you have the fear, you're bringing out the fear of God. Very practical. Not just a feeling, oh, I fear God, I just worship you. But, hey, in your speech, in your conduct, in your predisposition. So to conclude, the fear of man brings a snare. It will spire you to self-destruction. But the fear of God, the Bible tells us, is a fountain of life. The fear of man traps you in, like a snare, but the fear of God liberates you. Do you know that when you have the fear of God, when you know how to worship God, when you're in awe of God, you no longer live a diminished and a reduced life. You will become the man or the woman that God wants you to be, complete in Him. Hallelujah. To become Christ-like. So do not give up and settle for something less than that of a full life in God. But you can only do that when you have the fear of God, the second type of fear. And when you have the fear of God, God can, ra can help you to soar with wings like eagles. The fear of God draws you nearer. You know, normally you say, oh, fear is something that will drive you away, right? That's what fear does. But this fear is different. This fear of God, the first type of fear, yes, will drive you away. Like Adam, remember? And Eve, after they sinned, they say, and God said, where are you? Oh, I'm afraid. I'm hiding. So this first type of fear, because of sin, fear of punishment, will drive you away from God. But this second type of fear of reverence, I want to be near God, to make God happy, to receive that all He has for me. So this fear of God drives you nearer to Him, to worship Him, His beauty and His majesty, His power, holiness, grace, the whole lot, and more. And when you have the fear of God, you get Wisdom, counsel, understanding, power. So why not be a God 
spirit. It may not be invoked outside or even in, in Christendom, but it must be invoked at Emmanuel Church. That we are God-fearers. We want to draw near to God. Not because we have afraid of punishment, but because we want to worship God. We want to adore God. We want to be fascinated, to be enthralled by who God is. And finally, David, a real practitioner of someone who fears God, says, let me teach you three things. Avoid a poison tongue. Shun evil. Secondly, do good. And thirdly, to pursue peace. Let us treasure the fear of God. Let us not hide our treasure. Let us not lose our treasure, which is Zion's treasure is the fear of God. But let us be reminded that God has a treasure for each one of us, the fear of God. So let's pause and just reflect and let the Holy Spirit speak to us as a, you know, a, a Richard plays some music just to help us to say, Lord, let me gather my thoughts because it may be new to many of us, the fear of the Lord, the fear of Yahweh. Let's spend a couple of minutes and let the Holy Spirit do His work in our lives. fear of the Lord. Jesus delights in the fear of the Lord. You know, normally I ask people to stand to respond to God's word, but today, I want to challenge you to say, I want to be a God-fearer. And if you say, Lord, I desire to be a God-fearer, I have not been fearing you with the right kind of fear, maybe the sort of dread and, and so on, and oh, God is so holy, I'm not good enough. But God is saying that, no, you are my sons and daughters, you are released from the fear of slavery. Because you are my children. And you must have the assurance that God delights in you, that God delights to do good to you. God delights to establish you in the land that God has promised you. And your heart, instead of standing up, I want to invite you to just come and just kneel as a sign of surrender, a sign of humbling yourself in the presence of 
the greatness and the loftiness of who God our Father is. And if that's you, I just want you to quickly come forward. We just kneel in the presence of the Lord to say, Lord, I respond to your word today. I do not want to be afraid of man. I don't care what people think about me. My life will not be governed by what people approve of me. I'm more concerned and supremely that, Lord, I honour you, I revere you, I love you. I want to know more of you. I want to be more like Jesus. I want the fear of God. And if that's you, we just come forward as an expression. The Lord, I want to be a God-fearer. I'm not afraid of man. No more. I'm not be afraid of man anymore. My life cannot be governed by what man dictates, but what you, by your spirit, will guide me. Then you will have the wisdom. Then I will have the knowledge. Then I have the understanding. Then I have the counsel to be that man, that woman that God has for us. All right, so very quickly, yes. Come forward, those who really say, Lord, I want to declare, I'm not going to be a, to, to fear man anymore, but I want to fear you. I want to embrace that treasure, Zion's treasure. And as you do so, you're committed to do three things. Avoid a poison tongue. Okay, no unwholesome talk comes out from my lips. I'm committed to do that. Instead, I will release words that upbuild one another. Secondly, I want to shun evil. I'm going to do good. Because God, to do, God is very happy to do good to you. All right, this is amazing. You want to make God happy? He'll do good to you. And, th and thirdly, I'm committed to pursue peace. Okay? So, when you do that, just come forward. We can just do some uh, decorations. It's a good test, you know, like, oh, if I come forward, what will other people think? That's a fear of man. <laughs> if you have that fear, you have to break it and say, I don't, I'm not worried about what people think anymore. In the name of Jesus, I am free to be that person that God wants me to be. Okay? Okay, let's all declare together. Lord Jesus, especially those who are in front, okay? Let's declare aloud. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I want to be a God fearer. I want to be a God fearer. I want to have the second type of fear. I want to have the second type of fear. A reverential fear. Reverential fear. Lord, to honor you. To honor you. To love you. Love you. To seek after you. Seek after you. To pursue you. To pursue you. To be thrilled by your beauty. Thrilled by your beauty. To be awed by your omnipotence. To be, awed by your omnipotence. To be shocked by your omniscience. Yeah, because God knows a lot of things that you don't even know. I'm shocked. Hallelujah. In a pleasant way. Lord, I just want to worship you. And to worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Come on, Kara. To worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Thank you for giving me that treasure. I'm receiving it into my spirit. I'm rejecting all the lies of the devil. I want to be all that you want me to be. I thank you for your Holy Spirit is upon me. And I'm committed not to speak deceit not to let unwholesome words come from my mouth, but only words that build up. I'm committed to shun evil and to do good, and I'm committed to pursue peace. Father, we thank you that we have expressed that, Lord, from our heart, excuse me, from our hearts, and Lord, we thank you. We want to be God-fearers. We want Emmanuel Church to be known as a church who fear God. Lord, thank you. It is a gift from you. It is a gift from you. It is a grace gift from you. And therefore, Lord, we treasure that. We want to bring out that treasure. We want to manifest that treasure. We want to share that treasure. 
And in so doing, Lord, we know that we will see good life and good days and long days ahead of us. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you. We want to receive that promise. Lord, in Psalm 34, that those who long to, to, to have good, to um, a man who desires life, a man who loves many days, that he may see good. Lord, we want to pray that to be our inheritance. Lord, to be our portion. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I wonder whether there are any of us here who do not know Jesus, who have that fear to say, I may not make it. What happens? You can go back now. We can, you know what happens if I die? I know I'm not really that good a person. I try to be, but I'm not that good. What if I don't make it? What if I end up in hell? And if that's you, you want to find out more, can you just raise your hand so that we can talk to you afterwards? Just raise your hand. All right, we won't force you. We just want to share uh, the Bible with you, what God has to say. So if that's you, your visitor, or you're just a friend of somebody uh, from the church, just raise up your hand. Very quickly, just raise up your hand. Here is an opportunity. Do not miss it. Is there anyone? All are saved. All fear God. Okay, that's good. So let's uh, maybe end with uh, one of the songs there. Let's all stand. Being still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still. sing this verse again. Jesus. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come thou before Him now with reverence and Let me finish by reading 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. So the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit puts the fear of God in each of our hearts. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go and serve the Lord. Rejoicing. Hallelujah.